Dear, dear participants, can you hear me? <laughs> it doesn't start well. Ah. We will start. So, dear participants, uh, distinguished panelists, I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to welcome you to this ADB Institute side event uh, entitled uh, Mobilizing Climate Finance and Ensuring Financial Stability. How can Asia and the Pacific respond to climate finance risks? Uh, let me uh, explain that this event will be video recorded and uh, it will be then uh, published on the ADBI Institute website. And uh, like many other events uh, of this uh, ADB annual meeting, we will use uh, the application Pigeon Hall uh, so that you can ask your questions or share your comments. So to access Pigeon Hall, you can either scan the QR code or just go to your brother on your cell phone or your computer and enter pigeonhole.at and then you have to enter the password BLC 2024 and then you will see the title of the event and you can ask your question. So we, we hope you, you will ask a lot of good questions uh, because we want to have uh, an interactive uh, event. So now uh, let me uh, invite uh, Tetsushi Sonobe, the CEO and Dean of the ADB Institute, uh, to deliver his uh, opening remarks. Uh, Dean, over to you. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, uh, panelists, and Honorable Abhiman Prasad, Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for uh, Finance, and uh, Governor of ADB uh, from Fiji. And uh, uh, everyone, good afternoon and warm welcome to this side event on uh, climate finance. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to join us. Uh, last year, ADBI uh, could have two side events during the, uh, uh, the ADB annual meeting uh, in Incheon. Uh, but this year, we are allowed to have only one. Uh, so we have to choose the topic very carefully. But uh, yeah, please look at this uh, strong uh, attendance. So this uh, suggests that uh, we made a good choice. And uh, also uh, this suggests that uh, uh, this issue of climate finance, uh, especially the uh, corporate uh, information disclosure, is very, very important. And uh, this is an issue that many people are interested in. So, uh, obviously, my uh, role within this uh, event uh, is to limited uh, very much to just introduce uh, what this event is. But uh, because of this uh, great uh, attendance, uh, I'd like to uh, take advantage of this uh, you know, opportunity. And uh, please allow me to introduce a little bit about what ADBI, ADB Institute is. It's a ADB's uh, Tokyo-based think tank, uh, subsidiary of ADB, so very tiny addition of ADB. And uh, our mission is to bridge research and policy making uh, through multilateral exchanges of knowledge, experiences, and views uh, to identify sustainable and resilient development strategies and to help uh, governments and NGOs develop uh, capacities for sound uh, development management. And then, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so to do such uh, you know, bridging, uh, we have several uh, tools, and then this is the latest uh, addition of, uh, to our kind of arsenal. So this is a mobile phone app. And then, yeah, again, the QR code <laughs> is shown. So then you can reach the new app, and then on which you can see the so publications and the event calendar. Not only the event calendar of ADB Institute, but and the ADB. But also, if the organization registered with us, then they can you know, upload their event calendar. So on this day of this week, uh, oh, there are so many webinars and they seem to be interesting. So that kind of thing you can easily check and then immediately you can register to get the link 
Right? So this is for uh, many, many think tanks and universities. Uh, they would have uh, many webinars. Uh, they have plan next week, next next week, so webinars. And they, they want to let uh, many people know their events, but only small number of people check their website. But if, uh, you know, many people begin use, uh, using this uh, mobile app, then after lunch they can do this and then find very interesting ones. So, and also uh, publication discussion papers, uh, working papers uh, available. Uh, so please, uh, you know. And then this is because internet. So this is uh, useful, uh, can be used from any part of the world. But somehow the name is Think Asia. The reason is I want people to think about Asia and then also think from Asia. And then also it's nice to you know, think about uh, why this would, is just Asia, this is. Why not uh, think global? Yes, actually, they, everybody should think globally. But uh, by putting this name, they would think, uh, even though we are in Asia, but uh, we need to work together across the world. So, so I put kind of, kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, how, how to say, resist. And uh, if everything goes smooth, then nobody thinks. <laughs> so that's why this name. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the very important issue of climate finance. Uh, we are very uh, proud of ourselves uh, to have this uh, nice event uh, mobilizing uh, climate finance and ensuring financial stability. How can Asia and the Pacific respond to climate finance risks? Uh, this shed light on the uh, key role of financial supervisors and the regulators uh, in implementing an ambitious uh, response to climate change and the need to improve climate disclosure and the related financial policies to promote private climate finance. So, as you know well, climate finance and the mobilization of private sector capital to invest in climate action are of paramount importance. So currently, the world faces uh, three global gaps between idea and the reality, namely gap in global house gas emissions, gap in clean investment, and gap in climate finance. So these three gaps are uh, especially wide uh, in Asia and the Pacific, because Asia is a uh, factory of the world because uh, hard to abet sectors are strong in Asia, because coal-fired plants in Asia are still young, and the uh, uh, energy demand of people and the businesses in the region is growing fast as the economy, their economies grow fast. As a result, it is a huge challenge for the region to make a significant contribution to reducing GHG emissions without taking bold actions. So it's eventually us to, uh, who should take uh, initiative. Us. So then I think you wonder, everybody in this room wonder, when I say us, uh, whom I'm referring to. So it's really uh, you and me, so really the, these individual decision makers, because we can, we, we, can, we can encourage the companies that make you know, bold and effective, meaningful action toward net zero. And we can also penalize companies that do, are unwilling to take such actions. We can, we can choose which goods, which products and services we buy. Should we buy uh, goods and services from companies which are active uh, in the kind of green actions or not? Or when we save money or when we 
luckily uh, rich enough and uh, you know invest in uh, kind of security or equity uh, which company we will choose or eventually which government we will choose green government or brown government so it's us but uh, for us to play that important role as a leader or we need information reliable information that's why climate information disclosure is very important. And then, how to disclose every business owner's uh, wonder. So the rules and the guidelines are needed. And then there are such rules and guidelines already, like uh, 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 International Sustainability Standard Board uh, provided uh, S1, S2, S3. So, uh, those things are available, but uh, as I said, Asia and the Pacific are a bit kind of be behind. And uh, if, if the you know, government, financial regulator, and the supervisors push too much, too quickly, then the, their economies may be damaged, especially the uh, small and the medium enterprises uh, will be uh, in. Uh, very difficult situation and actually according to some some kind of opinion survey uh, from the uh, multinational companies big companies uh, are you willing to work with your suppliers from the developing or emerging economies or even if they are not uh, able to comply with those new standards uh, by helping them, uh, teaching them, uh, or you simply cut <laughs> the relationship with such suppliers and then replace them with the uh, suppliers in developed countries, developed economies, uh, which can uh, comply with the standards without teaching or helping. Then the 80% or something of the multi uh, national companies said we will choose the latter option rather than the uh, former. So uh, if we try to go too fast, then the problem. But if we go too slow, then we can make any change. So that's why the more and more uh, good dis oh, sorry. discussion is needed. And then we found that uh, oh, financial regulators and supervisors, even within ASEAN countries, uh, economic, they are not communicating. So they are wondering uh, what the pace, uh, the pace should be much faster or slower, and then, but without talking with neighboring countries. So then uh, my great colleague, uh, Professor Shirai, who is here and uh, will speak uh, after me, uh, came to me and uh, let's have, let's create the kind of forum of discussion. So if we discuss, then they learn, oh, not only us, but other neighboring countries are also uh, struggling and they wondering. And then maybe uh, it, it may be too early to jump into the new standards, so they can raise voice. If they don't know the other country situation, and then it may be only our country which is a bit behind, uh, they cannot raise voice. So in many, uh, not only this, but for many reasons, it's much better to have a communication. So we started uh, this project of uh, creating the forum of discussion and then uh, navigating the discussions for, uh, toward the, uh, in the very meaningful uh, direction. So this is an ongoing project. And then, so this uh, event is uh, about the progress of this uh, project and then the moving forward, uh, way to move forward. So uh, please allow me to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Sayuri Shirai, who is uh, my advisor for sustainable policies uh, at ADB Institute. And uh, she's also a professor at Keio University, uh, 
Japan's top private university. And uh, also, she's a former uh, uh, Bank of Japan uh, board member. And to present, uh, she will present more details about the project I just mentioned. And then she will introduce key concepts and share key data on the development of climate disclosure in the region. And then uh, uh, Bruno Carrasco, uh, DG of uh, CCSD, uh, ADB, uh, will chair a panel discussion with eminent, uh, prominent experts. I'm happy to have Honorable Biman Prasad, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Minister for Finance, and the Governor of ADB from Fiji. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and uh, we are also happy to have Datin Azarina uh, uh, Adam, uh, Managing Director as Securities Commission of Malaysia, and uh, Chuchi Fonasia, uh, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us to share your insights. So I hope you will enjoy the great, great discussion. Thank you very much. Now let me invite Professor Sayuri Shirai to uh, further explain the details of this uh, long-term project uh, implemented by ADB Institute and ADB on the importance of uh, climate uh, disclosure. So Professor Shirai, over to you. Thank you very much. So in my presentation, um, I'd like to uh, give a brief explanation about uh, our approaches toward mobilizing climate finance and ensuring financial stability. Uh, everybody knows uh, we have to do much more uh, you know, policy and responses to climate change, especially government is the one who have to do um, more uh, climate uh, policies, especially carbon pricing, environmental regulation, uh, and uh, you know, uh, various public investment to increase uh, um, uh, clean energy, and etc. At the same time, we think uh, climate finance is very important because the government policy tried to change uh, the corporate sector and uh, um, um, the industrial structure toward net zero, but we need finance to support uh, corporate sector's behavior. So we like to, in our project, we put a lot of emphasis on how to develop climate finance and uh, uh, climate finance market and the uh, system. Of course, our civil society is very important as well. Okay, so when we look at globally, um, still uh, a scale of climate finance is very small. And, uh, uh, and uh, also in advanced economy, we still do not have enough money uh, to finance climate finance. But what's more, if we look at emerging and developing countries, the very little money uh, goes to the climate finance. Why is that? At least I think there are three reasons for that. Number one, data shortage. We know uh, companies have to disclose uh, various uh, metrics, but the most important one uh, is the most standardized one is the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, especially scope three, because this covers the GHG emission uh, related to suppliers and the users up to disposal of goods. And also GHG reduction target are most important, but only very few large companies are started to disclose this information. Without the information, how can we promote uh, private sector's uh, capital flow? The second point is that uh, still there is a limited awareness, uh, not only among government, but also financial regulator and also uh, small banks. And we want to put a lot of emphasis at this stage on central bank and financial regulators, because they are the one uh, who monitor uh, corporate sector's behavior, and they are the one who decide uh, corporate sector disclosure, and the central bank is the one who monitor uh, commercial bank, and through commercial bank's funding, 
uh, they can influence small medium enterprises. So our project is focusing on uh, especially financial regulator, regulator and central bank. Okay? Through there, we like to influence private sector and uh, uh, capital market and banking sector. So uh, limited awareness is one barrier. And one more thing. We started to see some emerging you know, momentum uh, from many countries, and many countries try to do some disclosure, taxonomy, and many other uh, you know, policies to attract monies. However, uh, those approaches are quite fragmented. And then I noticed that in Asia, there are some uh, uh, emerging ac actions, but it's uh, quite a uh, diversion. And then I realized that maybe a, a, central, a, a central bank, financial regulator, they need to communicate more and understand each other. We all know maybe about Euro European <laughs> unions, what they're doing, but we don't know much about uh, what Asian and neighboring countries are doing. So uh, for this reason, uh, these three factors, we are focusing, okay? And so um, what we want to do is first, uh, we want to promote corporate sector's action but to do that, we need money, so we want to promote corporate sector level disclosure. And uh, you know, we want to promote their understanding about what is crime and risk, what is opportunity, what is the impact on uh, their financial performance. So focusing on corporate sector is important, but we do it through financial regulators. And second, at the same time, we have to pay, atten to, um, pay attention to the finance emission, that is banks, for example. And so uh, in the meanwhile, we also focus on uh, uh, finance emission and uh, their risk and opportunity, and therefore we uh, want to uh, co uh, work with the uh, central bank. Through these approaches, we think that we can contribute to promoting sustainable finance and financial stability. And so I came up with this idea uh, in May last year, and I talked to Bruno and uh, Dean Sonobe, and uh, this project launched uh, in November last year. The idea is that you know, we want to promote uh, the uh, information exchange and, uh, in, uh, in a, uh, at the informal level, and then learn from each other, and then uh, share their challenges how to promote disclosure and climate finance development. So uh, this is the most important thing, a uh, dialogue, okay? And, uh, and uh, we don't want to you know, uh, have a prescriptive ideas. We don't want to say you should do this and that. What we do is we take a neutral position, but we like to look at the global various approaches and we give us some basic uh, framework so that uh, financial regulator central bank can look at. And then in this way, we want to promote more Asian you know, uh, mutual understanding and hopefully in the future, it might lead to the common understanding. So basically, our project is comprised of three uh, issues. One is an informal forum. We started with the ASEAN uh, country, a PRC, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Japan, and Korea. Uh, we are going to have a more membership. And uh, at each uh, forum, we have a specific topics, and then we'll have a deeper uh, um, uh, discussion on specific issue, uh, for example, scope three emissions. And, uh, and also, we have a, a meeting with central banks uh, on the finance emissions. And then we do, uh, uh, we provide a capacity building. For example, last month, we just provided uh, capacity building for uh, 22 countries. And then started from basic, you know, we gave a very uh, detailed concept and uh, explanation how, and then what, uh, what they need to do in terms of disclosure. I think we got a lot of strong, uh, good feedback from uh, uh, 22 countries. And also, as uh, Dean uh, showed, uh, we have an online portal, and there we provide a lot of concept conceptual papers so that you can look at, and, uh, um, and then also we do the surveys. We will show you in a minute. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah web, web, web page is already shown by uh, Dean uh, Sonobes, okay? And so, yes, and then on the website, so we have a resources, a resource papers, and then we have a, a questionnaire survey result, and then uh, uh, we also have a summary of uh, each round table, uh, what was discussed and what was the important point, and all the information is uh, on the website, okay? So uh, this is example. So for example, uh, in February, March, we paid a lot of attention to the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of uh, uh, financial regulator, government are not clear yet uh, how to measure uh, scope three. So first, we like to promote understanding uh, among uh, uh, um, regulator, and, and, and then also we, uh, uh, we are going to have a, 
uh, round table uh, with the BIS uh, this month uh, with the 10 Central Bank in Asia, and we are going to promote their awareness, awareness about our finance emission. And soon we are going to have a, a discussion about transition pathway, and uh, and, uh, and so uh, we want to look at uh, what will be the credible uh, transition pathway so that investor will come in and starts to invest. And uh, hopefully in the future we want to do a deeper uh, deeper discussion about sector uh, transition. For example, electricity Asia depends a lot on coal power plants. I think it's time for us to discuss what will be the credible. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, transition approach uh, in uh, 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 electricity, you know, Asia should start to have a, that, that kind of dialogue. So we want to have a, a, this kind of analysis and also carbon credit, how to uh, calculate net zero emission and uh, bond integrity. There's a green bond, but uh, there is a various quality of bond. And then also uh, recently people started to talk about scope for uh, avoided emission. All these important things we will discuss at each time, uh, at each round table, and we to provide a basic uh, um, foundation uh, so that regulator can uh, discuss based on that. Okay, so this is one example. So uh, twice a year, we are going to do uh, question surveys uh, before round table. So for example, right now, I hope you know, uh, uh, ISSB will be a global standard. Uh, this is chosen by G20, G7, and uh, FSB, um, and uh, uh, EOSCO, and then basically, uh, ISSB is going to be global standard. Now, uh, this ISSB include TCFD recommendation, and they just uh, announced, uh, announced this uh, disclosure uh, last year. So uh, not, no, not, no, no countries have made it mandatory. So what we paid attention to this, uh, what is the status of each uh, country's TCFD recommendation, and also we uh, wanted to check the status of their pre preparation for ISSB. So you can see, you know, timeline, mandatory, and uh, whether they made an official endorsement, and uh, you know, um, what is their plan, and uh, whether they are going to apply only to the large, uh, large listed company, and etc. This is one example. So we ask 12 uh, regulators about uh, whether uh, they are uh, recommending uh, um, uh, their companies to disclose transition plan. And uh, most of the country at this moment, they haven't planned it. But uh, uh, promoting transition uh, plan would be very important uh, to have a, a, um, a credibility and attract uh, more funds. And then, for example, GHG emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, uh, some countries started to already recommend company to start to disclose. This is very challenging, but does uh, ISSB require uh, all the company to disclose scope one, scope two, scope three? So that's why we pay a lot of attention and, uh, we, uh, and then we give uh, a lot of uh, capacity buildings. So you can see still preliminary, but some countries have started to uh, um, and promote uh, this disclosure. For example, ISSB, we ask whether they are going to apply only to the uh, particular uh, listed companies or uh, all listed company. And then at this moment, 50% uh, of the country are going to apply to part of uh, listed companies, for example. And, and then another issue is you know, we, we ask whether a country is going to uh, require auditing uh, on this, uh, on this uh, climate-related disclosure and uh, uh, GHG emission, and then uh, probably at this moment about 60% uh, of the countries are planning to uh, require auditing. So we are going to do this kind of questionnaire uh, once a year and add something new, and then uh, every country can look at where they stand. Uh, we decided not to uh, disclose the country's name because we don't want to have a ranking. So, but uh, all regulator will know where they stand, and then other regulator uh, who are not participating in this program will know at least where Asia stand. So, this kind of information is very important, and uh, so you can all see uh, this progress uh, over time. Uh, I think uh, I ran out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Shirai. Uh, I realized I forgot to introduce myself, so let, 
just me let's uh, i will just take this opportunity to uh, say that i'm agnes Suri. i'm the deputy head of the capacity building and training department of the adb institute and i have the privilege to um, uh, support this uh, long-term adb adbi project on on climate disclosure so now it's time to start the panel discussion. So let me invite uh, our chair and the distinguished panelists to join uh, me on, on, on stage. So please uh, come. Please. So, um, as our panelists were already introduced by Dean Sonobe, I suggest we start uh, right now. So, Bruno, the, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, very good afternoon uh, to everyone. I'm delighted to uh, join this, uh, this panel on this very important topic. Um, before I, uh, I start with uh, some questions, hard-hitting questions to our excellent panel, um, I would just simply like to say that uh, as uh, in the Asian Development Bank, we are positioning ourselves as the climate bank for the region, for the Asia-Pacific region. Um, as part of that work, uh, we do a lot of financing uh, through our investments to address many of these outstanding issues related to climate financing, uh, addressing climate uh, mitigation, climate adaptation. Um, and through this work, uh, we're able to mobilize uh, significant amounts of resources. Now, what is critical is that um, as we face this climate challenge, or some would call it a climate crisis, um, we recognize the importance of financial markets. Uh, and for that matter, um, it is important that we engage with uh, the capital market uh, institutions, um, the regulatory supervisory agencies to uh, use the financial markets to help address some of these challenges. Um, as an example, um, we do recognize uh, that uh, through the broadening and deepening of the capital markets across uh, our developing countries, uh, we can certainly mobilize uh, much more by way of resources. We need to focus on such things as taxonomy, uh, on standards, and through that uh, we are able to do such things as issuing green bonds, blue bonds, sustainability bonds, and with that financing it helps uh, to uh, address some of those challenges and invest in the defossilization of, of our economies across Asia and the Pacific. But similarly, we also have a very important role uh, through the role of regulators, uh, where we can uh, ensure that there is greater transparency, greater disclosure in terms of reporting, in terms of listing requirements, and that is also a very important role that the financial markets play. So uh, a very, very important role all, all around um, in this work. Asia Pacific, uh, as you've heard from, from the Dean, uh, is uh, where the action is being played. Uh, over 50% of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from Asia Pacific. And on the flip side of the coin, uh, we're also increasingly hit by climate augmented natural disasters. Uh, I live in the Philippines, we live in the Philippines, we have many more typhoons, uh, there's less seasonality, it comes almost at any time, and uh, unfortunately it can create a, a lot of havoc, uh, loss of lives, loss of livelihoods, uh, loss of infrastructure, uh, and uh, we often see that a uh, lot of the gains in poverty alleviation unfortunately slip back. Uh, so it is a, a very important development agenda as well. Um, in if I can now turn to, um, to just to thank Dean Sonobe, uh, Agnes, um, Yolanda. Uh, we have been working very closely together, the Deputy Dean, uh, in bringing out what we consider a, a public good, and that is uh, learning uh, across uh, uh, many of the, the important partners in this endeavor to showcase what countries are doing, how we can learn from that process, uh, how we can build capacity development in what we refer to as the, the climate finance dialogues. So it's a very exciting initiative. And uh, through this uh, event, we want you to see the importance of this work. And uh, we can also learn a lot from our distinguished panelists. I'm going to now uh, turn to um, a set of questions that we will raise to our panelists. If you bear, bear with me for a second. Yep. 
Yeah, the got question. it. Yeah. Uh, can I borrow your mic? Actually, uh, very nice coincidence. I just heard that uh, in the in the audience, <laughs> we have actually a representative from ISSB. <laughs> so I just want to acknowledge this in case uh, during the Q and A session. Uh, um, Richard Barker, uh, who is uh, from the ISSB, uh, uh, wants to make any comments, or if some, if the audience uh, has any question, I just want to acknowledge his presence. <laughs> so, Bruno, over to you. Thank you very much, Agnes, and we're very pleased to, to have ISSB represented today in the audience. Um, so, um, th this is a, a question that will be um, uh, directed to to all the panelists. Uh, uh, Minister Prasad, uh, Chuchi Fonasier, and uh, Dati Nazalina. And that is really about um, the importance uh, and the role of greening the economy uh, and improving climate resilience. So um, we, we recognize, again, the importance of financial markets. Um, we are in a, a region where we have many diversified uh, degrees of development across our financial markets. Um, we have a, a lot of interest in terms of investment opportunities, and that uh, brings together a lot of the, the potential uh, financing that uh, we need to look at to address climate change. My question to each and every one of you is that, uh, how do you feel and share your perspectives on the importance of the financial markets uh, to address the climate challenges. But share with us a little bit in terms of the context, uh, your respective countries uh, there where you come from, and also where you sit in terms of the financial markets ecosystem. So we would uh, kindly ask for short uh, three minute, four minute answers, and, uh, and then we can take it to the next question. So let us start perhaps with uh, Minister Prasad. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, and um, I'm obviously very delighted to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I want to begin by saying that um, I enjoyed the presentation uh, that has already been made. Uh, the important points uh, with respect to data availability uh, or data shortage, uh, awareness, uh, and uh, the divergent approaches in dealing with uh, climate finance. Uh, but let me just uh, give you the context um, in which uh, the Pacific Islands are situated. Uh, and, we, and when you look at the context, uh, you know, you talked about the fact that 50% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the Asian region. But if you separate uh, the Pacific away from Asia, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions would be very, very insignificant. So in that context, uh, when we uh, talk about the Pacific, and I want to state this very clearly and perhaps unambiguously that the greatest uh, threat or the gravest threat of climate change uh, is felt in the Pacific. And the gravest challenge that provides to the security, the well-being, the stability of Pacific societies and economies cannot be underestimated. So when you look at the climate finance markets, uh, whether you look at it in terms of climate finance availability, the instruments that are there that are being developed, the research that you are trying to do with respect to how corporates behave, if you talk about small-scale corporate behavior in the Pacific, they will give you hundreds of reasons as to why these disclosures don't make any sense. So Pacific would be the only area or small island states in the Pacific uh, would be unique because no country outside of what we call the Blue Pacific uh, would be experiencing 
um, loss of GDP between 30 to 100 percent as a result of uh, the impact of climate change, extreme weather patterns, uh, droughts, flood. In our part of the world, uh, we actually hope and pray, you know, for about six months. Now it seems that we have to hope and pray for more than six months. But even with that hope and prayers, uh, we, we don't uh, get into a situation where we can address this. So for us, climate financing means much more than the disclosures by corporate entities. And I will, I will talk a little bit more about it, uh, perhaps in the, in the next question, uh, or when I come back to this question. But the point I want to make is many of the Pacific Island countries are at a stage where they cannot afford, even with good concessional financing, they do not have the physical space anymore to borrow and address the adaptation issues in the Pacific. So what we are looking at, really, you know, when it comes to financial markets, uh, availability of climate finance is not just borrowing. You know, you can talk about green bonds, blue bonds. We issued in Fiji, the governor of the Reserve Bank is here, uh, green bonds and blue bonds. Uh, we're looking at instruments. There's no doubt, you know, we, we understand this. But we cannot delay the urgency with which Pacific Island countries need climate finance because there is an existential threat already in the Pacific. No country outside of the blue Pacific has to worry about wholesale relocation. Legal you know, imperatives to actually see where these people are going to be if they have to be uh, moved out of their own countries. So this is the gravity of the challenge that Pacific Island countries have with respect to climate finance. Thank you. So thank you very much. Th thank you for a very, very eloquent uh, positioning of context. Context for many of the small island development states means everything. And, and for you, as you said, it's an existential threat. So we recognize that uh, there are many other important factors that we have to bring into the equation. Um, let, me, let me look at it from the point of view of, a, of another island country, but uh, uh, a very large island country, uh, multiple island countries for that matter, um, and uh, that is the Philippines. Um, so Deputy Governor uh, Fonacier, your, your take on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I do agree, really, that Asia-Pacific region is um, so diverse that um, such that we are actually at varied levels of economic development and priorities. And so we, at the region also, is the most vulnerable in, in climate and natural hazards. And you mentioned a while ago about the Philippines. And that, but we really are all together in making actions that, uh, towards, of course, climate uh, change, mitigation, and also adaptation. So in the case of the Philippines, uh, climate change adaptation uh, remains the country's uh, priority climate action, and uh, that mitigation also is pursued, given, of course, its environmental um, co-benefits cool and contribution to green economic transformation. And in response, the financial sector regulators, um, including, of course, Central Bank of the Philippines, uh, as well as the other, later on, I'll also be discussing uh, who are they, uh, who are they, and that um, we should, the financial sector regulators should remain committed in providing and enabling sustainable uh, financial ecosystem and all players and that would be the regulators included financial service providers uh, bond issuers the multilateral development organizations the academe included 
even rating agencies, assurance companies, and uh, advisors. So all of them have specific roles to perform supporting this ecosystem that I mentioned. And we are all guided by our commitments and policies as well of the government, which plays the primary role actually in this climate call. And so um, of the, the case of the Banco Central and Pilipinas, the Central Bank of the Philippines, we have crafted our sustainability related regulations in phases, and that's to equip the banks to effectively manage environmental and social risk in line with our, of course, financial stability mandate, uh, given the, the central bank's mandate. But at the same time also um, to encourage and that to unlock as well financing opportunities contributing to mainstreaming of the sustainable finance in the Philippines. And on one hand, we have also provided um, broad supervisory expectations um, on the integration of sustainability um, in the bank's corporate governance and risk management um, frameworks, as well as, of course, in their own business strategies and operations. So this is followed by uh, detailed uh, expectations from us, from, from the central bank um, as the regulator, incorporating um, environmental and social risk factors. Um, for them, that's the expectation in the bank's lending, investing, and even in their own uh, operations as well, given the impact of climate change on the bank's operations. And you know, Philippines is, is an archipelago, and that you mentioned that we are often, of course, visited by these uh, typhoons and other natural uh, calamities. And so, um, for them, the supervised institutions like banks, having already understood uh, the risks attendant to, to, um, to their operations with this climate uh, risk, and um, they have to have uh, some measures to undertake for them to be really operationally resilient. That's the expectation of the central bank. And um, we have also to equip them for them also to provide, as I mentioned, the needed financing uh, for those consumers uh, who's into not just on the, pl on the climate mitigation aspect, but even on the adaptation as well, and, and that for them as well as um, in their own operations to be right away on the business as usual mode when there is an extreme weather event. So um, the BSP and other financial sector regulators I mentioned like Securities and Exchange Commission in the Philippines, the Insurance Commission, um, as well as also the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation, we have crafted this sustainable finance taxonomy guidelines, um, which we have already rolled out starting February of 2024 this year. And so um, in collaboration as well with industry, um, other um, accounting uh, like accounting firms and uh, on the academia as I mentioned, and that's really for the adoption and implementation of what was also um, already the IFRS sustainability disclosure standards. And so um, we have to really institutionalize this process governing the IFRS standards, and this is, should be at the national level, and that uh, the central bank um, will also soon update our own disclosure requirements as far as the supervised institutions, our supervised institutions are concerned. And so we also actually pro, um, provide some incentives for them to uh, finance green projects and other sustainability uh, um, theme um, investments as well. And that's really all geared towards sustainable development. And I think I'll stop here for a second. Thank you very much. A, a very comprehensive presentation of uh, the whole ecosystem uh, behind uh, the prudential regulatory, the, the supervisory frameworks. 
and maybe, and perhaps anticipating in future questions, uh, a question that will come up is how do you coordinate across all the different bodies? But we will, we will take that up possibly in later questions. Um, let us now hear from, from Malaysia, Managing Director Azalina, and maybe if you can touch a little bit also on something that uh, Professor Shirai mentioned on, on data as you in some ways address this question. Thank you. Um, again, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Dean uh, Tetsushi and ADBI. Thank you for having me here. Um, I think I'm going to share two perspectives. One is ASEAN. I have the luxury of being in ASEAN and being actively involved in the ASEAN Capital Market Forum and also Malaysia's perspective. Uh, from the ASEAN perspective, as you all may know or not know, uh, it is a very, very diverse uh, region. Um, so therefore, for us, what anchors the whole climate change discussion is actually a just transition for all. Um, and so just to share in terms of the region, we've got um, among our members uh, having GDP per capita of 82,000 in Singapore and 1,000 US dollars in Myanmar. We've got varying uh, economic sectors that's at risk, ranging from agriculture to some transportation to others and manufacturing. Um, and of course, uh, on top of all of that, I think each individual country wishes to have their own NDCs. So ASEAN needs to see how to organize himself or herself in that context. And I'll be happy to share some of the things that I think we've done well and some that we can uh, improve on. Um, in terms of looking at the approach the capital market takes specifically, um, we take we use three tools that we deploy. And when I say we, these are the securities market and capital market regulators. First is instruments enabling transition finance instruments to quickly enable that so that there is no uh, stalling of funding and financing. Second, we actually look at standards and common language or common taxonomies as we talk about. And the third, which is also important, which is something that's discussed today, which is disclosures. In terms of instruments, let me just share very quickly, we moved from having introduced the ASEAN green bonds in 2017, then we went on to introduce in 2018 the ASEAN social and sustainability bonds, and finally in 2022, the ASEAN sustainability linked bonds. And where you're seeing it's progressing is from being in absolute terms green or sustainable or social to one that facilitates transition. Uh, we're very, very big in transition in that topic. I think all the regulators of the ASEAN uh, capital market and the financial markets are very, very committed to that, simply because highly at risk. So we need to make sure that it's facilitated. No assets are stranded, no companies are stranded. So we have that progressing. There's been good traction, about 48 billion US dollars have been raised. Uh, not so much on the, on the sustainability linked one, but the first two sets of uh, bonds that has been issued. So we're quite happy to see that. On the second bit, on the taxonomy, there is actually a effort that is worth looking at. I'm quite, well, I'm a recipient or I'm enjoying it, which is called the ASEAN Taxonomy Board. It is represented by all 10 member states. It is represented by all regulators. So the insurance regulators, the central bankers, the securities regulators are at the table and with one objective of creating a taxonomy for up to six sectors or six activities that will be defined. We have committed to actually release six. We have so far released three with public consultation and we are committed to getting it finished by next year because you know, we have to report into the ASEAN Secretariat, so that happens. So ASEAN taxonomy is great. The other thing that's also happening at the ASEAN Capital Market Forum is a transition guide, because the taxonomy is helping with financing of activities, but it doesn't help companies define their transition plans. So the ASEAN guide was issued in October last year to give companies a bit of clarity on how to develop a pathway to actually move towards their own goals. So I think that is a very important uh, bit on, on, on standards or as you look at transition. Disclosure, 
Uh, I think we will discuss that a little bit later. I won't go far into that. Malaysia has taken a very similar perspective as well. So we have similarly in Malaysia the SRI standards and sukuks, which is the Islamic bonds. We have also gotten the taxonomy, but we decided to go with the, what we call the principal base. The taxonomy is interesting. It has a principal base as well as a science base. Um, so we left that at national level, and the team is now developing the, what we call the screening criteria, or the science-based one, in alignment with the ASEAN taxonomy. So I'll stop right there, because that's kind of some of the things that we're looking to do. Very, very eloquent. Thank you very much, uh, Managing Director Azalina. Um, instruments, uh, taxonomy, and disclosures, uh, both at the ASEAN level, but also at the country level. Um, very important. Uh, we, we certainly are a strong believer in, in regional cooperation and working together in regional groupings. Um, a very, very interesting set of answers uh, from the different perspectives, from, from looking at context. Um, I'm going to jump into um, something that, that is a little bit more, more controversial among certain circles, and that's the potential of uh, green monetary policies. As you know, um, across central banks, uh, there's still uh, some degree of, uh, of controversy, um, and uh, often at times it takes uh, uh, a view that uh, central banks uh, may not have uh, a model uh, to uh, address some of the climate risks. Um, some of these risks are more structural in nature. Um, and what is uh, heard often is that uh, even if they did uh, have the model, they don't have the tools uh, to address many of these uh, risks. Uh, that uh, is, is set against another view which suggests that uh, there can be some operationalizing of, uh, of instruments to try to address uh, some of the concerns that climate poses, including on, on financial stability, um, as well as even on, on inflation. Uh, and here we've seen that uh, over the past few years, some central banks have indeed uh, adopted some extraordinary measures in terms of um, uh, use of balance sheets, um, uh, expanding their balance sheets, uh, including looking at investments into um, uh, co corporates that have uh, introduced environmental criteria um, as a way to incentivize uh, some, some of these companies towards greater, greater disclosure. Um, there is, of course, many other policies, and another one that, uh, that comes up often is that, uh, that of green credit policies. So can uh, regulators, central bank regulators, provide financial institutions with a window of, um, of lower interest rate financing or rebates uh, for such uh, investments or financing in terms of new clean technologies. Um, so there's also some examples of that. Um, so even now, there seems to be some scaling back of, of course, some of that uh, extraordinary balance sheet measures. Um, against this backdrop, um, we would like to hear a little bit the views of the um, of the Honorable Minister of Finance from Fiji, as well as from Professor uh, Shirai. Uh, where, where would you stand in this debate? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the, um, so the adoption of uh, green uh, monetary policy by central banks um, would actually represent a significant shift um, you know, in terms of integrating, uh, you know, green monetary policies into traditional, you know, monetary policies. And for Fiji, I think uh, some of the examples or the lead that has been taken by other central banks could be a uh, learning, um, you know, uh, starting point. Uh, but um, the governor is here, and uh, he will tell you that um, uh, the Fiji corporate uh, bond market is negligible. Uh, and, um, but there is, I think, potential to educate, uh, to develop uh, further those ideas um, and, and create opportunities uh, for corporate bonds uh, to um, uh, incorporate uh, them into more friendly, sustainable, you know, considerations. 
the uh, Reserve Bank of Fiji, uh, you know, Fiji is slightly a bigger country, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, monetary policy development and so forth. So uh, I think there is a p potential to incorporate uh, some of those, uh, uh, you know, we, as I said earlier, we issued um, green bonds, we uh, issued blue bonds, but uh, as I said before, the context in which the Pacific Island countries operate, uh, you could have uh, many of these very innovative, uh, well thought out, um, green, uh, so to speak, you know, monetary policies, um, you know, the whole process of decarbonization uh, as a mitigation measure uh, globally uh, fits into what the Pacific Island countries do. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, um, a lot of these things uh, would amount to a very slow, insignificant intervention into the speed at which uh, the damage is being done uh, to uh, infrastructure. So in the Pacific, uh, including Fiji, anything we build, whether we build a school or a health facility or critical bridge or any infrastructure, uh, it has to be climate resilient infrastructure. And the instruments of climate financing that are available through these, uh, whether it's monetary institutions or other institutions uh, or other regulatory mechanisms, uh, is a drop uh, in the ocean. So we keep coming back uh, from the Pacific to our partners, uh, our development partners, uh, international, you know, uh, multilateral banks, and, and say to them that, look, you know, we can't be punished twice. You know, we didn't uh, put out the greenhouse gas emissions there. So, you know, we've, we've been punished already. Then we are faced with a lot of these instruments. Um, the ability of Pacific Island countries or small island states to access climate financing, uh, even if some of these instruments uh, are tailored, uh, if there is a window uh, to say, okay, this is what Pacific Island countries or small island states should use to access uh, financing, it is not enough. So, you know, this morning when I met uh, the, uh, yesterday I think, when I met the president of ADB, I said it's time that ADB needs to uh, take a different approach apart from concessional lending or normal lending based on market interest rate. We need to explore other instruments, which means grants. You know, whether you look at loss and damage fund, whether you look at, um, you know, uh, accessing um, uh, GFC funding, the modalities, the instruments that are there, the mechanisms to access those financing is just too onerous for many of the uh, small Pacific Island countries. And many of them do not have any more space left physical space left to be able to borrow even very, very concessional uh, finance from uh, multilateral banks. So to address that urgency of, of uh, building that infrastructure adaptation uh, strategies, and if you don't do it now, the cost of doing it later would be just too much and it could become prohibitive for many of the Pacific Island countries to actually do something about, uh, you know, the climate exigencies or the emergencies that they would have. Yes. So that's um, the context in which right. yes. one can look at, you know, green monetary policies or other instruments. Correct. Thank correct. You. No, thank you very much. We we do recognise again the differentiated approach across small island development states. We recognise that uh, building quality infrastructure 
is uh, good, good policy. We recognize the importance of, of insuring many of your, your important assets is good policy. Um, so there's a, a, a lot that we can do beyond the, the climate finance space. Um, let me turn the question now to uh, Professor Shirai, uh, monetary policy, greening monetary policy. Thank you. So um, I, have been work, uh, I have been talking with uh, many central banks in Europe and United States and Asia. And so I kind of understand uh, central bank's approach. When we talk about monetary policy, it's quite challenging for central bank to do it. The reason is that, as you know, monetary policy is, uh, is adapted uh, to cope with the business cycle. So it applies to all economies. So if economy is in downtown phase, they try to lower interest rate, affecting all the economies. However, when we talk about you know, green transition and climate change, we want to, uh, you know, we want to promote structural change, right? industrial change, corporate restructuring. So it's more like a structural policies. So it does not, uh, to be honest, it's not completely consistent with the purpose of a monetary policy. So for this reason, at this moment, it's very difficult for central bank to adapt a comprehensive green monetary policy. So in the past, uh, like uh, uh, ECB, uh, they did this corporate green, uh, they, they purchased, uh, uh, they did a corporate uh, bond purchases, and they adapted tilting approach, which means they cannot exclude you know, certain sector because of the, those are brown and the, uh, uh, carbon emission intensive, because it's very difficult for central bank to, uh, to have a, such kind of a negative screening approach. Because central bank often say they are not uh, you know, democratically elected, so it's a government job, not a central bank. So it's very difficult for them. But they, so what they did is they did a tilting approach. So try to have a, a greater weight for the green, you know, related activities. However, when they started to normalize monetary policy and raise interest rate, they stopped it. Right? So it's very difficult for them to continue when there is a high inflation. So they start to raise interest rate. Then uh, it's true with a higher interest rate, uh, it undermine some of the uh, renewable uh, you know, energy activities. Uh, but uh, you know, if they have to, and then some civil society people ask uh, a central bank in Europe, uh, they should have a two-tier approach. For example, central bank can provide some uh, long-term lending uh, to the commercial bank, uh, which provide uh, uh, green uh, finance to the corporate sector. But once they do that, uh, central bank have to distinguish which one is green and which one is brown. And that is very difficult for central bank to do it. So uh, what uh, they can do is, if uh, they adapt, the government adapt taxonomies, uh, environmentally sustainable activities, then central bank can use those taxonomy. But otherwise, if the government does not uh, introduce the taxonomy, it's very, very difficult for central bank to do it. And so that's why there is a lot of hesitation. There are some central bank which uh, uh, adapted some lending activities and then pr uh, provide, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, accept a green bond as a collateral for central bank lending to the commercial bank, but uh, they can do it only to the limited extent. So uh, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, con uh, adapting uh, green monetary policy is a bit challenging. Over time, I think each country starts to adapt the taxonomy and then more disclosure from corporate sector is possible. Then commercial banks have more information about emission finance. Then probably in the future, uh, there may be possibility that central bank can start to do green monetary policy, but at this stage, it's very challenging. But central bank can do a lot more on, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, prudential approach. I think that that is related to the next question. <laughs> Very good. Nice segue. So yes, my next question is exactly on climate change and financial stability. So um, there seems to be more of a consensus across central banks on the importance of uh, climate risk and embedding that into the uh, financial stability framework. Um, uh, central banks typically now are conducting uh, scenario analysis. They are conducting stress tests to see how their balance sheets can withstand changes. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the markets about uh, pricing uh, climate risk and uh, are we underpricing climate risk or not? Uh, what are the implications of that? Um, now, despite all of this work that is happening, we're still seeing, of course, a lot of lending to, to the brown 
uh, instead of green industries. Uh, we recognize, for example, that if a financial institution is lending to the next coal power plant, uh, they may end up in, with stranded assets if we're moving towards a defossilized economy sooner rather than later. Uh, so that has also very important implications. Uh, we know that the uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision uh, has recently completed uh, a consultation paper on Pillar 3, Disclosure Requirements, and we understand that uh, that um, work has now um, been uh, completed. Um, we're hoping to see what the um, results are from there. Um, now, with all of these challenges that I've mentioned, um, um, how can supervisors um, uh, respond credibly? Um, what can central banks still do to incentivize financial institutions to go towards decarbonization beyond the climate scenario analysis, recognizing that those, um, those, those uh, terms on those uh, scenarios um, uh, have, have a very important implication. Um, so perhaps with uh, these uh, challenging issues, um, maybe let me take it to the Deputy Governor of the BSP. Uh, your thoughts on that, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually the Philippines is, um very negligible contribution to the world's total GHG emissions. But given increased economic activity um, as, a as the economy is trying to recover from the pandemic, uh, this is actually the GHG emissions may increase. And so um, with this also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, given that the Philippines is the most vulnerable um, one of the most vulnerable countries to, to the adverse impacts of climate change and uh, natural hazards, um, and that's owing to our geographical location. So given this, the central bank recognizes that uh, climate and other environmental risks actually pose a um, significant threat to the financial stability. Um, that's not just uh, concerning individual banks, but the entire system as a whole. So we also recognize the, the immense role, of course, of the banks in providing financing support to the government's projects, and that's to achieve the sustainable development um, of um, um, climate goals as well of the country. Um, and in, that's also including a just transition to a low, carb a low carbon economy. But we should also, of course, bear in mind um, for any potential unintended consequences, um, considering current economic development, uh, as well as some related fiscal challenges also of the country, or even actually the energy security of, of our country. So and that's where uh, the importance also of the transition plans would come in. and. Um, even as well on the climate uh, adaptation uh, measures. So for us, in our sustainable finance framework, uh, which we issued, uh, the central bank as the regulator, we also have other supplementary regulations um, that we set out for banks, and that is our expectation is this should have strategic environmental as well as uh, social objectives, and that would cover um, let's say for the short, medium, and even the long-term uh, horizons um, in integrating sustainability into their, as I mentioned earlier, into their lending, uh, investing, and even in their own operations as well. So this may also include, um, like for instance, for the banks progressively increasing uh, their targets um, to uh, a portion of their loan portfolio allocated for green um, finance and also including sustainable projects or, um, or activities. And then after that, they have understood, of course, the inherent risks. Um, they can still, let's say, um, um, lend to some brown projects but that they should really clearly demonstrate their uh, rationale behind for doing that. And that's where also where the transition plans that we are requiring the banks would come in 
um, they should really carefully lay down there um, how to transition, of course, to the green and then progressively, as I mentioned, increasing their overall loan portfolio, including their investments to green. So that's where we are right now in that um, also in their transition on, as well as deleveraging their own um, um, loan portfolio. So that should be included in their transition plans being submitted to the central bank. But also we note that part of their own strategies, meaning from their banks, that's where they also articulate really their own targets and that um, would hopefully as well um, work hand in hand with that of the government's uh, targets. And, but at the end of the day, what's really important is that banks would continue to engage their clients, uh, meaning their own uh, the transition as well plans of their own clients, and how will that come into play with their transition plan being submitted to the central bank. So what we're saying is that um, we need to carefully, of course, uh, take a look and strike the balance because in doing so, meaning the transitioning, there could be some effect on the other corporates and the other um, um, players. Like for instance, um, the SMEs, which actually comprise more than about close to 99% of the entities in the Philippines. So it may have an impact as well on their own operations. Very good, thank you, thank you very much. So, so the credibility of those transition plans are essential, uh, and if they're not taking it seriously, it, does the central bank or the regulator have some enforcement ability to say that these need to be tightened, needs to be more robust? Uh, if we get that right, perhaps that whole scenario works out. Yeah, right. Actually, we do engage the bank on an individual bank basis, and that's where we take a look at the transition plans that they're submitting. So there's a constant dialogue on how they can really fully transition and looking at the roadmap and the timeline that they have set. So um, we need to have, of course, integrity as far as the, the su tra submitted transition plans. And that's why uh, this is where our uh, intention right at the start is for them to have a tone from the top, meaning this is not just all about compliance with the central bank's requirements, but really the buy-in of the board and senior management in crafting their transition plans. And this were yes. where the integrity would come in. And in some ways, if they have that skin in the game, then they will be much more stronger in right. terms of bringing yeah, in the exactly. realism of those Exactly. Plans. That's what we are looking at right Very good. Now. Very good. Yeah, uh, let me now turn to Professor Shirai on the same question, climate risks and, and the implications on financial stability. Can you also walk us through a little bit the importance of the physical risks uh, as, as opposed to the transition? Yes. Yes. So, um, as I in my presentation, I mentioned disclosure is most important. Without disclosure, we are not able to scale up climate finance because what we want to do is we want to uh, promote, uh, we want to invite um, a more general uh, um, investor base, not just the ESG investors. Okay. So, for that reason, uh, there is a global standard. Uh, which is right now ISSB, which incorporated TCFD recommendation, and there they ask companies uh, and, uh, to disclose, uh, you know, their impact. Uh, I mean, uh, the impact of uh, um, um, the transition risk, fiscal risk on their uh, fis uh, financial performance, and uh, um, and, uh, and and also uh, without corporate sectors information. We cannot really ask uh, banks and the uh, financial institutions to disclose their finance emission. So corporate sector information is the only Im important things. And then I hope that ISSB will be uh, uh, much more understood. And uh, you know, we had uh, these 22 countries uh, um, capacity building uh, last month, but uh, very little knowledge about ISSB standards. So much more has to be done uh, in, to in terms of improving this uh, understanding of ISSB. But also this Basel committee on banking uh, supervision is very important. You know, uh, as uh, uh, Bruno said, this is a pillar three 
Uh, yeah, pillar uh, one is a uh, uh, basic capital requirement. Pillar two is a uh, uh, internal um, uh, uh, internal risk modeling and so on. But pa uh, pillar three is disclosure uh, market discipline. So disclosure is a market discipline. That is uh, what uh, BCBS understand. So uh, by disclosing the corporate sector and banking sector's information, market can check uh, which one is more ready uh, for the net zero, which one is not. Okay, so therefore, uh, uh, market discipline, uh, in order to have market discipline, disclosure is important. Uh, BCBS is very important. BCBS is based on ISSB uh, standards. So therefore, uh, these two are very important. However, uh, this ISSB and, uh, um, um, and the BCBS uh, consultation paper have not touched on emission target. Okay, so I think central bank, when uh, they have to start to monitor more deeply about commercial banks, because after all, Asia is dependent on uh, banking system rather than capital markets. So we have to pay much more attention uh, to the uh, small, medium enterprise, and therefore, commercial banks are important. So that's why central bank has to start to do um, uh, better monitoring uh, on banking system. And then, you know, just disclosing, uh, uh, you know, G finance emission is not enough, right? So we have to start to check, uh, you know, uh, uh, emission target. You have to start to check whether the pathway, decarbonization pathway is aligned with the Paris Agreement. And then we also have to pay attention to hard to abate sectors. They are like steel, cement, fertilizer sectors. Uh, they, they are very emission intensive, but we don't have enough te good technology yet. Uh, to promote their decarbonization. How are we going to make assessment of those, of those uh, uh, emission intensive industries? We don't have an answer yet. So I think it's time for central bank to start to have a deeper understanding about how to measure the commercial bank's uh, financial mission, etc. Yeah, very good point. And the importance of market discipline, which is premised on, on having the data, reliable data, having the taxonomies, uh, that stand the test. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a house being built, a house uh, work, work in progress, as they say. Very, very good points, Professor Shirai. I'm going to go to the last question, then we're going to open it up uh, to to the floor. Um, uh, w one of the things that that we've heard throughout this discussion is um, how do we coordinate, uh, on the one hand, uh, the the listing requirements, if you like, on the part of uh, corporations. Um, and the role of the SECs, um, and, and how do you integrate that with uh, more of the financial reporting uh, and disclosure across financial institutions and the role of the central bank? Um, so I think my question is, um, how, in your views, do we get better collaboration between the two sets of, of market regulators? Um, and, and how? Um, what are some of the challenges that, that you face? And if anything, how have you been looking at addressing this problem. So uh, I leave these last questions, uh, one for um, Minister of Finance and the other one for the Managing uh, Director. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I, I think uh, we all agree um, on the need to promote uh, more proactive collaboration between capital market regulators um, and uh, obviously, you know, central banks. Uh, and that, of course, will create uh, and support and enhance uh, disclosure requirements uh, for both companies and banks, uh, and perhaps provide uh, or foster a better, uh, you know, climate finance, you know, development uh, agenda. Uh, obviously, uh, we, uh, I mean, most countries in the Pacific would support uh, the key objectives of the ADB Institute and the ADB Climate Finance uh, Dialogue in the Asia Pacific region uh, and within our own jurisdictions. Uh, in the Pacific, uh, we uh, have been sort of advocating a much more deeper, uh, meaningful regional integration. And when we talk about a much more meaningful, uh, deeper regional integration, uh, we actually talk about uh, collaboration uh, 
uh, on a number of uh, you know areas where the regulators get together, where the central banks get together, uh, where you know climate finance agencies get together, and of course uh, you know the role of ADB uh, in facilitating you know some of these uh, sort of dialogue uh, is going to be uh, very very uh, useful. Um, we, uh, when we talk about uh, deeper and more meaningful regional integration, uh, we also feel that uh, because the Pacific countries uh, are so vulnerable, uh, and as I said, you know, many of them face uh, existential threat, um, the whole issue of climate uh, emergency um, is not perhaps, you know, understood uh, as much as, you know, it ought to be. Um, and so when we talk about decarbonization, uh, although the Pacific uh, doesn't always consider itself to be part of the problem, uh, when the problem has landed on them, uh, we see decarbonization as a global public uh, good, uh, or the the global public uh, approach uh, to deal with the uh, issues of uh, climate change. So uh, I, I think the issue of uh, promoting climate change um, or climate finance awareness, um, capacity building in those areas, uh, facilitating the exchange of knowledge, uh, best practices, and what some of the bigger countries in Asia uh, do, central banks do, um, and we encourage, you know, collaboration. Uh, but let me just, um, you know, uh, end by saying this thing again, that um, the, when we talk about climate finance, you know, apart from all these instruments, mechanisms, uh, regulatory aspects, of what, and I think this is good work that ADBI is doing. Uh, I think it is, it is relevant. It would support efforts uh, for a much better understanding of data requirements, uh, awareness, uh, and the different approaches that could be used uh, to enhance private sector engagement, enhance you know, uh, disclosures in a much better way to support the whole agenda of decarbonization. But on the side, I think the, the institutions, global institutions, financing institutions also have to understand the urgency and the new modalities or the new windows that would be required to fund um, adaptation measures in countries such as the Pacific. Because without that agency, none of these things that we are discussing here that may matter to some of the bigger countries in the, in the Asian region would matter to the people and countries in the Pacific. So, you know, while I, while I appreciate, you know, and understand and we support and we do uh, contribute in our own ways to mitigation measures, in fact, there is much more uh, attention to providing climate finance for mitigation in some of the smaller Pacific Island countries than for adaptation. Mm. When the need for adaptation much is much bigger than uh, the need for mitigation measures. Mm. So uh, that's why I wanted to uh, fully, thank you. Fully recognize that, that dilemma. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very good. Um, Managing Director Azalina, you have the last word on this. Okay. Um, I think when you look at disclosure, that's the third pillar that I mentioned to you about. And I think connected to it very closely is the taxonomy because that's the common language and in disclosure just simply reflects the reporting and the monitoring. Um, as I think you alluded to earlier as well, data is the toughest one. And the people that we, or the corporations that we worry about the most actually, I know there's a lot of discussions around financiers and the banks. The one that is truly facing this challenge are the preparers, who are the corporates, 
the listed companies and the value chain that they have, which is all the SMEs that have to report into scope three. So the capital market regulators spend a lot of time dealing and speaking to exchanges to see how we can provide sufficient time. Uh, I think the ISSB standards, professors, I agree with you, is in the right direction. The only thing is how fast do they make the change, um, how much time is given, making sure that while countries and companies are transitioning, uh, that they are not penalized or seen unfavorably. I think that's the biggest worry and therefore not providing them access. So I think where we have seen that is that um, we have seen a lot of discussion around, uh, even in ASEAN, a very uh, collective approach to engaging um, IFRS and they've been very supportive about that. The capacity building, the engagement, to make sure that companies are not left behind you know, the unintended consequence of this. So we appreciate that. There is, in fact, a, a, a lab that has been set up to try and help with a little bit of mapping. I think the challenge that we have in ASEAN in particular, nearly 80 over percent of the companies have uh, used GRI standards as a starting point. Therefore, uh, a lot of them having this transition probably just need time to move in that general direction. Um, the other point I wanted to make also is um, if you look at the Malaysian context, for example, similarly, Malaysia also uh, had put in place the GRI context, DCFD, before. And what we have ongoing, for example, in Malaysia, uh, the exchange has already made a, a, a statement uh, in, insofar as to the phased approach to the reporting. So Malaysian main board companies, which are the larger ones, are meant to start their regulatory reporting around climate matters in 2026 reporting at the end of their financial year. So we're not about to change that halfway as, they are, as the companies are preparing for this to say, oh, by the way, could you just add a few more things? So, so there is a, a good chance that we're going to keep that on track with a view that we will try and add to that. Now, in Malaysian context in particular, we have an advisory committee set up to your question as to how do we bridge between the financial regulator, which is the central bank, and of course the security regulator. Um, so we have a committee, an interagency committee set up, chaired by the Securities Commission, simply because of the listed companies that are involved. But there is a central bank, is a member of the committee, the Companies Commission, the uh, audit on site, uh, the audit on site oversight board as well, and the exchange, because these are all four different agencies that are probably going to, in some way, directly or indirectly put up a requirement somewhere where companies will get affected. So we are now, so the, the committee is actually looking to run a survey to look at how do they bring that to alignment, more, more focused on timeline, uh, Bruno, rather than whether we're gonna do it, but you know, how else to do it without creating unnecessary disruption. Um, just wanted to also make a point to what uh, Deputy Governor talked about, which was the SMEs, this is a group that in Malaysia in particular, we pay close attention to. It is uh, a very critical part, as in with all of ASEAN. I think all of ASEAN SMEs account for nearly 90 over percent of corporations contributing to anywhere between 35 to up to 60 percent of their GDP and employment, even higher numbers on employment. Uh, for Malaysia, it's actually almost 40% to GDP and almost 50% to employment. So this is a group that you cannot ignore. Uh, and their challenges are very different from the main board companies as well. So in Malaysia, example, we have actually on the same line as creating the committee that is looking at the disclosure for big companies. We have actually come up with what we call a simplified ESG guide for SMEs in the value chain to try and help them map how to actually contribute, although it's not required in uh, ISSB, but they are having to make reports in for scope three. So we have actually done this guide and we're going around talking to the SMEs, testing it with the, um, the likes of Nestle and their value chain to make sure that it is truly simplified. Because when the regulators do it, it's not simple for the SMEs to do. And we found the challenges they had was really focused on the environmental 
of the three. Social and governance, they could disclose, they could find the data. Environmental, it's as rudimentary as, I don't know what data you are looking for. So I think we're going to spend a lot of time in that capacity building something, you know, so that's kind of where we're at trying to bring that together. Thank, thank you very much, Azlina. Very, very good points all across the board. Uh, I'm going to open it up to comments from the floor, but just before that, um, we at ADB are also facing a lot of the challenges that many of you have raised. Uh, we had our first TCFD in 2022. We're now looking at how we move towards an ISSB compliance. Um, that, that obviously is something that uh, all of us are grappling with. Um, in terms of the bonds that we've mentioned, uh, we, we've issued uh, green bonds, we've issued blue bonds. Uh, we invest in countries, green bonds and blue bonds. Um, so that's all very interesting and exciting. Uh, and also, I think, to your point, uh, there's uh, a lot of opportunities also for financial intermediation lending for MSMEs across Asia Pacific, helping them in that transition. And I think there are lots, lots of opportunities there. So thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, I'm aware that we've gone beyond the hour, uh, but it's been so interesting. And I've seen that most of you have stayed, so that's a really good sign. Thank you very much to the panelists for that. Um, we had, uh, I believe, a gentleman from ISSB. Uh, I didn't see where he was. Oh, there he is. Uh, perhaps if you'd like to share any, any thoughts, uh, hearing a little bit what you've heard. Uh, thank you. Um, if we can get some microphones. There we go. No? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, so I'm a, a board member of the ISSB. Um, it, it's fantastic to hear these, these comments about, about the ISSB and the importance of a, of a global baseline and, and, and all coming together with a, with a common set of disclosure requirements. The um, points are well taken about capacity, about scope three, about, about proportionality and, and so on. So uh, implementation of the standards has to be done in a, in a smart way. Um, but the alignment of towards a global standard has to be the, the, the way to bring all these things together. So thank you for your kind comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And yes, you, you mentioned proportionality, which usually comes up uh, a number of times in these discussions. So point taken. Um, perhaps we have a time for a, a few, uh, maybe two, maximum three questions or comments uh, from anyone. Um, uh, yes, uh, this is my colleague, Jung Kyu, who's uh, working in the finance uh, team. Thank you very much. I think it's very interesting. Also, we learned a lot. Uh, I have actually two questions, but I'm not sure whether uh, Bruno allows me to raise two questions in given the short time. The first question actually is uh, the greening the monetary system, greening the financial system we talk about here. And because of the banking sector providing the financing to the economy as a whole, given this physical and the transition risk, I think the banking sector, in terms of the level of exposures to the risk assets, is most vulnerable. So in that case, integrating of this uh, the climate finance risk monitoring into the banking sector regulatory framework, I see that it's really the must. But given all challenges mentioned, central banks understanding, you know, SMEs and things like that. And I think, you know, we cannot change the old structure things over the one, one night. So I think it's a good idea to listen. What would be the innovative action, including the coordination? Definitely that climate risk monitoring, you know, collaboration, it's, it's very innovative action, I believe it. But what do you think actually you can add up in terms of additionality that's number one question. Number two question is actually... Who's that question directed to? Uh, uh, Professor, Professor Shirai. Shirai. Okay. And then number two question is actually about the transition, uh, the pathway. Uh, our uh, the ADB's home country and the Philippine and deputy governor, actually. And you mentioned about the transition pathway and also the plans and the striking of balance is very important. But here, the question, many investors are actually raising the question, First one about the transition pathways, how much it is credible? How much it is ambition enough? And, and also even Professor Shirai mentioned about the emission reduction target, do we have to put it in? And, but data is a fundamental issue. So I'd like to ask that question in, to our deputy governor. Thanks. But we have two questions. Thank you very much, Junkyu. Any last questions? Uh, yes, please, Ayumi. Okay, very quickly. Uh, the 
Okay. To, for me to ask this question, and actually, you know, that I would like to get answer from anybody, you know, but then to ask this question, I may have to introduce myself a little bit, that, you know, I'm Ayumi Konishina for ADB staff, or, you know, for former ADB staff. I'm really known as the ADB staff because I was with ADB for 32 years. Um, now, after I graduated from ADB, I'm now helping the initiative, multilateral initiative called Multilateral Cooperation Center for Development Finance, which basically, you know, in collaboration with ADB, World Bank, IFIs, we try to promote high quality connectivity infrastructure investment in developing countries. Now, one of the, you know, projects we have been providing, you know, the grant assistance was to China Exim Bank to improve their environment and social standards so that their operations can be greener, safer, you know, okay, more climate friendly, those things. Similar assistance we're providing in Brazil, BDMG support, you know, similar activity. Or in Africa, uh, for the creation green finance initiative. Now we are pro working with African Development Bank in uh, Morocco or Egypt, again, to introduce green finance. But then all these initiatives actually now, those banks re realize that you know, they'd like to do something that's good, but then still they need some financial support, also the technical support to make things happen. Now, the question I have is how we can really incentivize more and more financial institutions, banks, private sector you know, institutions, really to provide climate finance, you know, greater let's say, high-quality financing to developing countries. And I'm certainly, you know, concerned about Fiji or the Pacific countries as well. But then the key, you know, okay, we're talking about huge number of private sector financial institutions. We have to incentivize them. Now, is that going to be done through the regulations or through incentives? Okay, so that's the question. I have here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, regulations or incentives? Um, I'll let anyone decide who wants to take it. But in the meantime, uh, Chichi, can we get your views on the uh, transition paths uh, first? Thank you. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, uh, the transition plans that I'm talking about is the ones that we, re we are requiring from our supervised institutions. And uh, those are the, the, the banks, of course. And so, um, what I mentioned earlier is that we do engage them on a per bank basis, really, because they have, have their own unique um, circumstance, even taking into account the business model as well that uh, they have, uh, that, they, that they do have. Um, so different and um, it, also on the principle of proportionality as well. And this is where I'm coming from that uh, at the onset, when we do um, roll out our sustainable finance framework, we really had the intention of um, having the buy-in, uh, meaning it should really be a tone from the top. Um, this is not just all about compliance, uh, but really uh, board and senior management should really be in it. So that's where also when they craft their own transition plans, um, it should have, of course, the the inputs and, and it should be emanating or it, it's a tone coming from board and senior management and this is where we said um that's where the credibility would come in because this is not just mere compliance but it's, ex it's exactly the buy-in as well so that's where the transition plans that we require them and so um there could be a back and forth as far as the bank submitting to us and how are we evaluating it and relating it to their all to their overall uh, business uh, model um, taking into account proportionality of course of that particular um, institution and even considering also are they domestic systemically important banks something to that effect and for even those small institutions as well which have really an impact on the SMEs. So they're providing, um, of course, finance for the SMEs to be able to access. So there's really a lot of uh, considerations to be made and that's where um, our evaluation would come really on a per bank basis and that's where I said it's a tone from the top. Thank, thank you very much for that point. Um, who wants to take regulation 
or incentive or regulation and incentive? Bruno, sorry, can I what just a, add a little yeah. bit to the question around transition? Uh, the ASEAN capital market has in fact uh, rolled out a finance or, or transition finance guide for companies uh, to help them develop a credible transition plan. It was rolled out in October last year. We're going around with the second round of consultation for that. Uh, what it needs to demonstrate is actually a climate ambition. So there are three categories that companies can put themselves into. One, whether they choose to be uh, committed to be aligned to the 1.5 degree target. The second category is to be aligned to the well below 2%. And the third is that they don't have a target, but they're progressing there. Because ASEAN takes a view of inclusion. That means, you know what, even if you don't know, just start looking at these numbers, start calculating them so that we can then, with time, have companies uh, getting involved. So maybe that's something you can look at, and that has actually been endorsed across of the ASEAN capital markets for companies to look at as a starting point. Um, and that, if it's coupled with the ASEAN taxonomy that is science-based to help funding of projects, might be able to help them a little bit. And, and would you be able to disclose which percentage comes under the, the 1.5 as opposed to? Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> no. Perfect. Okay. Professor Shira, you wanted to take on the other question. You know, I think, you know, we have to differentiate uh, transition risk and fiscal risk when we talk about corporate sector's emission or uh, banking sector's emission. Uh, with regards to uh, fiscal risk, it's uh, more related to location. Of course, uh, from a uh, climate model, it's very difficult to uh, project the severity, but at least we know where, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, which region have uh, subject to a lot of uh, uh, um, climate change related to natural disaster. Uh, what is very challenging is, uh, uh, I think, transition risk. Because uh, to, to, have a, to, to check each company and banking sector's transition uh, risk, first of all, we have to know uh, scope, uh, GHG emission, scope one, scope two, scope three, where uh, you know, this uh, emission, uh, GHG emission concentrate. And so um, without that, uh, it's very difficult to talk about uh, uh, transition risk. So once we know uh, where supply chain, uh, just GHG emissions stand, then you know basically you, you, you can use uh, carbon pricing, you know, uh, um, theoretical one or EU's highest one. Then we, we can kind of calculate the impact of carbon pricing. So the most important thing is for the uh, transition risk, we need GHG emission data. So uh, that is uh, basic. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I am very much aware that we've taken up uh, a lot of your time. Um, we wanted to obviously thank the excellent uh, interventions from all the panelists, so please join me. Before we close, um, we uh, will ask the, the Deputy Dean uh, if he can give some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, distinguished guests and panelists, particularly Honorable Biman uh, Prasad, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance of Fiji. Uh, today we had an excellent exchange. Um, Professor Shurai, in her presentation, highlighted the importance of comparable, reliable, and consistent climate related information disclosure in order to promote. Uh, crime finance and ensuring uh, financial uh, sustainability. But uh, I believe, I also believe, as mentioned by Dean Sonobe in his opening, that uh, we have to, we need to take into consideration that uh, different condition of each country and each economy, and uh, particularly uh, different condition between large companies and uh, SMEs. Uh, in implementing climate-related crime information disclosure. In the panel discussion, uh, panelists raised uh, diverse challenges to uh, green and climate financing, uh, also challenges to the green and monetary policies. And they shared uh, their distinguished views on how to mobilize uh, the climate finance financing and uh, views on the role of financial uh, supervisors, regulators, as well as central banks. Also, thank you very much, 
uh, the IS, ISSB uh, delegate for your uh, valuable comments. Um, you know, uh, the main goal of our long-term uh, project, uh, the Asian Climate Finance Dialogue, is to uh, stimulate fruitful exchange on key ingredients and best practice to scale up uh, private climate finance. The project will continue in uh, this year and next year, and the next steps will include the organization of high-level roundtable in Singapore on transition finance approaches in September, and the capacity building workshop focusing on climate disclosure by banks and financial institutions in Tokyo in autumn this year. Thank you again, and let me close this event. Uh, finally, uh, yeah, as you, as you uh, see in the uh, backdrop, backdrop slide, please scan the QR code and take a moment to share your feedback uh, on this event. Thank you very much.